<clears throat> we continue our study in making the most of life from A to Z. We have uh, progressed to uh, the letter F. And in doing so, we have encountered a very big subject, and that of forgiveness. I want to advance on through here to uh, a couple of places that we have looked at. One of them is in Genesis 41, 51. This is the occasion when David makes the statement concerning the things that he had surf suffered. For God said, He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. David, on the birth of his first son Manasseh, said that he called him Manasseh because God had caused him to forget all the things that he had suffered. We enumerated a number of the things that David had to forget. He had to forget what his brothers had done to him. He had to forget what happened to him when he got to Egypt uh, in Potiphar's house and then finally in prison. But eventually, uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph would uh, remember that God is the one that had been in control. And eventually when his brothers came, and when he finally encountered his brothers, you remember he made this memorable statement. You did it to me for evil, but God did it to me for good. And so uh, in view of all that, Joseph had uh, forgotten what he had suffered at the hands of the Egyptians and also his own brethren. It's a difficult thing to do, isn't it? This may be one of the most difficult things that we are asked to do uh, in living the Christian life and also in our relationship with others. And that is the uh, necessity of forgiveness. Now, we also noticed a little bit about the threefold forgiveness. Number one, we have forgiveness from God. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 9 through verse 12, uh, Jesus talks uh, in his prayer about the forgiveness of God and the necessity of forgiveness. His request was that God would forgive as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, then, a little bit farther on in that chapter, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, and as we read on from there, it says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now verse 14, it says, For if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If we expect to have the uh, forgiveness of sins, do we have any alternative other than forgiving others? If we refuse to forgive others, then God is not going to forgive us. Now, remember in the story of David, as he walked on the roof of his house, as he did so, he saw Bathsheba bathing herself. He sent messengers, and they went and found her and brought her uh, to David. Uh, they, they lay together, a child was conceived, and in the process of time, David tried to make everyone believe that Uriah was the father of the child. David tried various things to get Uriah to go to his house and to be with his wife, but he refused. 
he was a noble man. He was not going to take advantage of being in his house with his wife while the captain of the army and his companions were on the battlefield. And so he refused to go. David wrote a letter to Joab, the captain of his army. And you can think whatever you will about David and what he did, but I've always thought this was kind of a callous thing to do. He wrote a letter to Joab and told Joab, in the heat of the battle, you put Uriah in the front and where the battle is raging. Do you know who carried the letter to Joab? Uriah. Uriah carried his only death wish or warrant that David had written it to Joab and he gave it to Joab. Later on when David is confronted against this and as he writes the book of Psalms, he makes the statement. He says to God, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Ultimately, that was the case. But he had sinned against Uriah, hadn't he? But in sinning against Uriah, he had sinned against God. I think we can conclude from that, when we sin against others, we're actually sinning against God. For all of the creation of God and all belong to God in that sense. And David sinned against Uriah by having his, him killed, but he ultimately had sinned against God. Our sin, when we sin against others, is against God. We want God to forgive us. But if we're not willing to forgive others, then God is not going to forgive us. We're asking God to do something that we're not willing to do. And so we are to be willing to forgive others as they trespass against us. Then we talk some about the forgiveness of self. Uh, Paul talks about forgetting those things that are behind and pressing on to the mark of the high calling of God. It is difficult for us to forgive ourselves. There's no one who knows us better than we ourselves. There's no one who understands our weaknesses more than we do. We probably see ourselves as not very worthy in comparison to Almighty God and in comparison to the one who died for us. And we see ourselves as being unworthy of forgiveness. And sometimes we have difficulty forgiving ourselves. We may sometimes find ourselves living in the past with all of the things that we have done and all of the things that have happened. But living in the past is a useless exercise. When we live in the past, it may keep us disturbed because of things that we have done or things that others have done. It keeps us from experiencing the joy of living in the present. It keeps us from experiencing the joy of having the forgiveness that comes from God. I know that memories travel through our minds, don't they? Memories come up. Uh, it seems like that we're helpless. At least uh, I seem to be helpless 
to the fact that memories come. I, I don't always invite them. I don't always want them to be there, but sometimes memories come. Now you can choose to pass on and get back to the future, or you can choose to live in the past and struggle with those things. If God has forgiven us, and He has if we're a faithful child of His, whatever there was in our life, whatever we have done, God has forgiven us. We must press on and be like Paul, putting those things in the past. Paul had a great deal to put in the past, didn't he? He had persecuted the church. He had given his consent to the death of those who were serving God. And he thought that he was carrying out God's will. He had a lot to deal with. That was there in his mind. Even though he tried to put it behind him and he pressed on to the mark of the high calling of God, he would sometimes make this statement. I am the chief of sinners. Now sometimes we may try to take over that spot. But we need to be able and willing to forgive ourselves. The only way to judge a man's religion, as one has said, is by what it does. Matthew 12, 33, uh, people are known by their fruits. As we look at our lives and the, what we practice and the faith that we have, we see the results of it. To me, living the Christian life and growing spiritually is a lifetime uh, effort. I still remember the day that my daddy bought me a new bicycle. And I still remember getting on that bicycle and trying to ride it, and I hadn't gone but a few feet, and then it was on top of me. And it was a struggle trying to learn to ride a bicycle. And, all, and it didn't take long without thinking I could get on that thing and go down our driveway, which was a long gravel gravel driveway, just going as fast as I wanted to, throwing them brakes on, throwing that thing around, throwing gravels everywhere. Now, I don't know exactly the moment that I learned to ride that bicycle. You probably don't know, and I don't know, the exact moment, the events that took place, and the things that happened in your life where you actually became a more mature Christian. Where life became like riding that bicycle or driving a standard shift automobile. As we started out, we may have struggled with what do I do in this circumstance. But as time goes on, it just came automatic. We knew what to do. And we did it. And the life that we live and the results of that life is born out in what our faith has led us to become. And it is by that life and the fruits of that life that people see the results of our faith. Now, let's talk about the bigness of forgiveness and it is a big matter when we think about forgiveness let's go to Luke chapter 23 and verse 34 
the context now in which these words are said is when Christ was crucified. As Luke records these events, it says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Our Lord understood the situation, didn't he? He understood what was going on. He understood when the people did these things. Forgive them, they know not what they do. There's a little bit of insight uh, to be gained in taking a look at the original language and the statement then Jesus said does not adequately capture what uh, the writer actually said. As the writer looked at this situation, he saw these events, saw Jesus on the cross, he saw Jesus uh, praying for the people about the cross. He chose a form of a word that actually says, and our English has a difficult time capturing this, but if we would put it in the way that Luke would have said it, he actually said, then Jesus continued to say, Father, forgive them. It was not just one time. It was something that Jesus did over and over. And Luke records this and it says, Jesus continued to say, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And so Jesus understood the uh, circumstances with these people. He understood uh, what they were doing. And if perhaps they had understood, maybe they would not have done it. I don't know. But it was according to God's plan that these things uh, took place. As we deal with other people, it might be sometimes that they don't understand. People often say things against the church or about the church because they don't understand. People may say things about you because they don't understand. They don't understand the faith that you have in God. They don't understand how that faith affects your life and how it leads you. They don't understand your hopes, your desire to go to heaven. They don't understand your desire to do what's right while you're upon this earth. So sometimes as you're dealing with people, we have to take into account the fact that they might not understand what the circumstances are. And so before we judge others, we must remember, I don't, I don't have all the information. I don't know everything about the person about the circumstances. And so as Jesus prayed for these people about the cross, those who had crucified him, those who had nailed him to the cross, those who had reviled him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is merciful. 
So take a look at Matthew 18. Really begins in verse 23. Our Lord said, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. Now, folks, I don't know whether this was actually the case, whether Jesus was using this as a, a, a means of just illustrating uh, how much mercy this man was going to be shown, but 10,000 talents of silver was a great deal of money then as well as now. It was an amount that this man could not possibly repay. I don't know how this man came to have so much debt. Why did his master entrust him with this much money? Had he not investigated whether or not he could repay it? Nowadays, if you go and get a loan, you've got to fill out a lot of paperwork, and there has to be some idea that you're going to be capable of repaying that money, or you're not going to get a loan. But this man had... Uh, a great deal of money which he owed to this man. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment be made. That would be rather drastic, wouldn't it? Selling a man, his wife, his children, all that he had, in order to get his money back. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. Have you and I ever been in a similar situation where we owed a debt we could not pay? And someone else paid the debt? Of course we have. That was Christ. We owed a debt we couldn't pay, and Christ stepped in, and He paid the debt. We were loosed. We were forgiven. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. Very small amount. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Now, we see the contrast between the two individuals, the master who forgave his servant, and the servant who would not forgive the one who owed such a small amount. And as you read on through the story, you'll find out what happens. The one that had been forgiven was finally cast into prison. He had to pay all that he also owed. Let's talk a little bit uh, about mercy and that of forgiveness. I want to go to uh, let's see here, Luke six thirty-six, if that's the one. Yeah. 
Luke, uh, Luke 6 and verse 36. Our Lord again speaks and says, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Now notice the sentence goes on. Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. Now what is it that men are going to give unto us, good measure, pressed down, and running over? Mercy. We're to be merciful. We're not to judge without mercy. We're not condemned. We are to forgive. We are to be a merciful people. And if we give mercy, it's going to be given to us. Now, there's another verse along this line. James 2 and verse 13. James says, For ye shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Mercy prevails against judgment. But if we judge without mercy, the Bible warns us that we shall be judged without mercy. So we notice that forgiveness is understanding. Forgiveness involves mercy. God certainly has been merciful to us. It was only through the mercy of God that such a plan as that which unfolded through Jesus Christ could make it possible for us to have the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 10, verse 17, God says, Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. I'm thankful that God is the one that's doing the forgiving. I'm thankful that God, and He wipes out my sins, He does not bring them to memory again. If you were to stand before God and you had the opportunity to ask God and you could ask God, God, you remember when I did such and such? God said, no, I don't remember that. Now, God is the one that is able to forget. And as we each day go through our lives, when we sin, we repent of that. We ask God's forgiveness. We are cleansed by the blood of Christ. Our sins are wiped away. God does not hold those sins against us. Now here's a question. You're a faithful child of God. You live each day in, your, in service to God, living by faith, loving God and allowing God to love you, repenting of sin, you have occasion to sin, and you repent of that, and God forgives you. The blood of Christ keeps you clean. You do that to the day that you die, and in the after a while in the judgment, for what are you going to be judged?
Somebody want to venture into that? You've lived a faithful Christian life. We're told the books are open. Another book was opened. The dead were judged out of those things. Of what are you going to be judged? If we understand the mercy of God and the forgiveness that God extends to us and the cleansing of the blood of Jesus and we die in that state, what is there to be brought against us? I don't know about you, but to me, that, that's a great comfort. That's a great encouragement. Absolutely. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. Now we know that there are many on that day when the, the time comes, those books are going to be open. And another book, which is the book of life, their names are not going to be found in there. They're going to be judged according to the life that they have lived. There are only two ways to live. We live the good life or we live an evil life. There are good works and evil works. One of those is going to characterize the life <clears throat> that we live. I believe it's in Romans 8, verse 3, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Now, folks, we're, we're, we're left with a decision here as far as I'm concerned. We either believe that or we just continue to live, and I, I hope I'm good enough to go to heaven. Folks, none of us are going to be good enough to go to heaven. I hope I've done enough to go to heaven. Uh, you can add up works from now on, and you're never going to do enough to go to heaven. The only way you and I are going to go to heaven is because of God's forgiveness, His mercy, and the blood of Jesus, which keeps us clean. And we live faithful to God. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ. And we understand that means that those that are in Christ who live faithful and who serve Him live by His will. But we either, we either have to accept that or reject it. So, we're, we learn here that as far as God is concerned, He is forgetful. Well, what about us? When we forgive, can we forget? Uh, we may learn not to bring it up constantly. But from time to time, we're going to be reminded. Now, Carol and I both have used this illustration all these many years when we had a chance to teach on this subject. I have a scar right here on the back of my thumb. I can tell you when I got that scar. I can tell you why I got that scar, and I can tell you what I was doing when I got that scar. And occasionally I look at my hand and I see that scar and it reminds me. But you know, I don't think about it every day. And I don't dwell every day on the fact that I have that scar. But from time to time, I do notice it. And it may remind me of what happened, and then I go on. When there is some occasion that happens and someone 
or we sin against someone and we ask their forgiveness. We forgive them or they need our forgiveness and we forgive them. We have to move on, do the best that we can. But what about if a person sins against us and we forgive them or we sin against them and they forgive us? How do we deal with it? Well, we, we do our best to act as though it had not happened and go on. What about if somebody, uh, we have sinned against somebody and we go to that person, we ask them to forgive us and they don't forgive us. Folks, we've done all we can do. It's just like God in providing salvation for us. He's made salvation available. He has made forgiveness available. He's done all that he can do if we do not avail ourselves of that forgiveness. And God's done all he can do. And so it is the same with us. Uh, <clears throat> In Luke 17, 4, and also uh, in Matthew, Peter asked, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? He says, should I forgive him seven times? In Luke chapter 7, uh, 17, Jesus says, as often as your brother comes to you and says, I have sinned against you, and your brother wants forgiveness, then you forgive him. Now, this is just my opinion on this matter. Others may have a different opinion. I must be ready to forgive. In my mind, I'm ready. But I can't forgive a person unless that person has repented and wants forgiveness. Even God operates on that principle. God is ready to forgive. But he forgives when a person repents and confesses his sin and asks forgiveness. I've long believed that God does not ask me to do more than he does. I think in following his principle, we're probably on safe ground. I'm always ready to forgive you should always be ready to forgive. And when somebody asks for that give forgiveness, we give forgiveness and we move on and do the best we can. Okay, thank you.